got I got more details out of you just by <laughs> so welcome. Uh, it is it is just noon right now. So Melissa, I'm going to introduce you because as we have these conversational bits before I forget to introduce myself and and the people talking because I'm so caught up in the moment. But I'm Emily. I think everybody here knows me. I'm the director and curator. Uh, and I'm have I'm really excited to introduce Melissa Cook Benson, uh, born in Oconomowoc. Is that right? Oconomowoc, yes. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Wisconsin and uh, went to school to get her MFA from University of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, she specializes in powdered graphite on paper and her work uh, investigates uh, uh, the relationship between photography and performance and drawing in portraiture. Uh, but also uh, maybe portraiture through um, in a non-traditional sense, I might say. Uh, she's represented by uh, Coplin Del Rio in Seattle, Washington, and your drawings have been exhibited all over. I don't want to spend all the, the juicy time with me telling people about you. They can find more about you on your website, um, but we're really <laughs> pleased to have you here today. And we're, we invited several artists from North of the 45th to talk with us about their work and meet with us in their studios uh, uh, in these short lunch conversations. So thank you for kicking off this um, series. Well, thank you, Emily, and thank you for inviting me. Thanks to the DeVos Museum of Art and to Michelle Grabner and Brad Killam for uh, curating a, a, a lovely show. So it's an honor to be included. Yeah, we're super pleased to have you here today. Um, I don't know if you want to start by just going through the questions or if you would like to um, start by talking about what you're working on. Um, it's up to you really. Sure, here, I'll, I'll start by uh, giving a little bit of insight into how the drawings are created. So right behind me, you can see my palette, which is a, a stool with uh, powdered graphite in it. And powdered graphite comes in essentially what looks like a peanut butter jar, speaking of peanut butter sandwiches. Um, <laughs> and uh, I just pour it out and I dust it on with anything soft. And then uh, after I dust on that graphite, I erase away details. And so I have two drawings behind me in progress at different stages. And then I also have one that I just started over there as well. And then, another one in progress here. So uh, powder graphite is used as a lubricant in machines and in guns. So it's got a little bit of like a tooth and a, a, a grease to it. And so I'm able to draw on the wall. And when I dust on it basically attaches to the paper right away. I've tried other pigments and uh, they just don't have that same kind of tooth to it. So I dust it on and erase away and it's this additive subtractive process. That's so cool. Uh, one of the things I'm curious about is I see your, your drawings. You don't, um, it doesn't look like you have anything to protect the surfaces right around the parts that you're working on. Is that, mm -hmm. is that uh, how you work? Like just yep. it seems very brave. <laughs> yeah, that, that is how I work. And I've noticed a few people that I follow on Instagram set up these uh, elaborate masks to protect the paper. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit uh, wild with that, I guess. Um, so my process is actually quite physical. Um, like I said, they're hanging on the wall. And after I do a few marks, I tend to step back look at it and then come back and, and draw some more. And the, the drawing process, some people assume that I'm like in my studio like this, it's like essentially like scrubbing at the drawing with anything like brushes. Um, so it's really physical. And so perhaps I should mask it, but I, I try to incorporate it into the drawing. Yeah, that, uh, can you, speak to the importance of scale in your work it, you say it is really physical and and you aren't really like working on this really teeny tiny thing although some of the things that you work on seem quite precious uh mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about how you started working at such a large scale 
Uh, well, when I first started with Potter Graphite, it was kind of on a whim and based on a suggestion by three people who didn't tell me how to use the material because they, uh, they weren't really familiar with it either. They just thought it could be well suited to me. Um, and I just had a big piece of paper that day that I first grabbed the get can of graphite. And it was a 38 by 50 inch piece of Stonehenge, which is the biggest piece of paper I could get at my local art store. And I've used that same paper ever since. And it ends up that it's the best paper used with powdered graphite. It was just essentially, I think like fate or something that I found the right material. But uh, now I love that large scale because um, I think that size not only affords me the ability to have my mark in my hand more apparent in the drawing, but I like that physicality. And I like the idea of a drawing being something that like a viewer can almost walk into and get hit by in the chest, you know? Um, so it, it's almost like this intimate, intimate uh, content matter, but in a, a very large, scale in, in a, a way that it can almost embrace the viewer. Um, but yeah, I also just like drawing close up skin and hair. It's always been an obsession of mine. It's just like now, that tech, tactility. Yeah, the subjects that you choose, are they, um, are they people who you're close with? Are they, uh, can you speak to a little bit to how you select your subjects? Uh, yeah, so from about 2008 until 2012, 2013, they were all self-portraits, but in a very performative manner. I used to do a lot of characters and kind of work through different things that were happening in my life, like relationships and what, by dressing up as others or dressing up as different personas. Um, and then... I, I lived in New York for three years uh, with my now husband, Eric Benson, who's also in the show and you'll also be chatting with later. Um, and the subject matter shifted because my sense of self really shifted after moving to New York because, you know, I was in one of millions of people. Um, whereas when I lived in Madison, I felt like I could really be a performer. So that, that shifted when I moved to New York and I started looking to um, the city, the streets, um, specifically started uh, drawing wheat paste posters and graffiti because I liked how it became almost this dialogue between other different artists. Um, so there was, you know, someone's poster and graffiti in front of it and behind it. And we used to walk about a mile from our house to the studio every day. And um, my favorite season was always spring because you'd start to see this layered conversation start to happen on the, on the brick buildings around you as you walked around. Um, and then after three years living there and you know doing more like landscapes and some really up close to of skin and hair where I, it was getting more abstract, I moved to Minneapolis and uh, since have had two kiddos. And so it's gone back into um, the figure again, some of it being uh, my daughters. And then I also recently drew my mom and my grandma and um, getting back into some self portraits after taking a hiatus for a while with that. Yeah, that's, it's really interesting to see how place might inform your work. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I think now we could talk about the context of like COVID, how that has changed, like what we wish to capture or focus on. Um, mm -hmm. So ha has, uh, w with the world the way it is now, what is a typical day in your studio? What does that look like? Or how do you make time um, now that you have a, a, a you have a busy ex exhibition schedule, you have a family, and and I know it's hard to fight for time in the studio. What does that <laughs> look like for you? Uh, so uh, we're both home thanks to COVID, and um, sorry, my alarm just went off for some reason. Uh, we're both home, and so uh, for the most part. And Eric tends to work in the mornings while I watch the two girls, uh, 
do distance learning preschool with our four and a half year old, make some lunch. We go on like a nice little family walk. And then after the family walk, I get my uh, afternoon in the studio and then it's, you know, dinner time. So that's been our, our schedule. So I've, I've been grateful for being able to have some time, um, but it's also wild being isolated with two small children. <laughs> I can imagine. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, uh, oh, so I was just gonna say, uh, and, uh, I, I started working on a show that's now up at St. John's University in Minnesota in Collegeville um, at the Alice R. Rogers Gallery. And I started the, the show uh, a few months before COVID came and you know the pandemic really hit hit us and after the pandemic hit us I ended up taking about half the drawings down off of my walls and kind of reassessing the world as it is now and making uh, a whole new body of work that was really influenced by COVID and being quarantined and in social isolation and, and stuff like that so um, I felt like the mood of the world really affected the mood of the show. Yeah, and and amazing that you sort of were able to switch gears like that and yeah. felt the motivation, obviously you felt a tug to do that, right? Yeah, because it, it felt like some of the, the tone or uh, the mood of some of the other work, the ideas of some of the other work just didn't feel right anymore. So I like, I. I couldn't get myself to keep going on them, even though there were, you know, some of them were nearly done. Um, and so I did a whole new show. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta do that. Yeah, which is like, no no stress, no pressure on you at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do, you, so you talked a little bit about how you work with the graphite, but kind of start to finish in terms of like influence and making the work. Uh, is there a methodological approach or or like uh, you talked just talked a little bit about that too, but is there some more sort of discrete details about uh, usually how how you start the process through the end of the process of making a work? Yeah. So I feel like I I'm really influenced by my environment, the people around me, um, basically the world that I'm surrounded by. So I tend to, I think, digest the world through my artwork, but it tends to take a few months, sometimes even a, a year to digest what's happening before it becomes an actual drawing. Sometimes it's quicker, like uh, the, the previous show, um, but, uh, so I, I tend to process events through taking photos and, and thinking of ideas. Some, some things like specifically in Brooklyn when I was walking around here, I hung up an older drawing. So here is, uh, oh my God, I'm blinking on his name. Oh, <laughs> oh Lionel, Lionel, Lionel Richie. Richie. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I, I would walk around uh, the city and take photos um, and then start to essentially uh, combine images uh, from different parts, uh, different photos that I've taken and then layer on my own hand on top of that. Um, that's how that process worked. But sometimes it's like I, I take a lot of photos that I think would be an interesting drawing or somehow encapsulate something I'm thinking about, something I'm processing. And then uh, from there, I, uh, you know, make it really big. <laughs> so I, here's the very start of a drawing. Um, so those, these two are the, uh, from the similar photo set or the same photo session where I, I haven't had a haircut ever since COVID like many people. I used to have bangs, now I don't. So I took uh, my hair and I braided on a mask over a mask and um, now I'm also doing a stop motion animation. So that's a little camera setup that I have going on. Um, so I, I sometimes set up these scenarios and 
uh, take photos. Other are just like around, around my environment. And then after I translate it onto a big piece of paper, I just start uh, working in the graphite in layers. And so I've, I've started thinking too about ways of incorporating my hand more. So it's not as much of a you know straight up photo, trying to think about ways that um, I could take more and more artistic liberties away from the photo. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I like doing hair is I feel like my hand or like the way that I work really comes through when I draw hair. <laughs> so that's why I brought, that's one of the reasons why I started doing those too. So does that explain my process? I, I think so. Uh, <laughs> but then it leads me to this question about photography. Do you, so you always work from photography, it seems like, and is there a point, oh, oh, do you, when you're working with a photo, do you ever simplify the photo or um, do you know, like, what is your gauge to stop rendering something? Uh, is there a level of interpretation in the photo or, or um, is there a real um, sort of, are you compelled to create exactly what you see there that's captured in the photo? So it kind of depends on the piece. Um, and I always uh, say that I, I've never really thought of myself as a photographer. So I always want my drawing to have like almost more life than my photo ever could. Um, I tend to know when a drawing is done when it starts to feel like it, it, it sparkles almost from the inside. Um, and I, I, I like to try to capture that light that for me, I can't do in a photo. Um, and specifically the piece that I did uh, that's, that was in the show um, was a drawing that was based on, yeah, if you could pull that up, that would be great. Um, but it was a drawing that was based on uh, a Valentine that my daughter had done. And it was a Valentine on a doily. And so it was like this, um, this unselfconscious uh, childlike marks that she had done. She was a, maybe almost four years old when she did that. Um, and so I love the hand of a, of a child, um, just that, that energy and that um, confidence in the mark making. And I think when I start doing things like that, it gives me, it affords me even more ability to, um, stray from the photo. So I was trying to think more about how to make it, the marks interesting and the surface interesting. Um, and to have my hand in there as well, along with her hand. And I like the ability too, with that image of uh, the challenge of the doily and all of that high contrast. Um, so super technical versus that really gestural mark that she did. So I'm, I'm trying to push myself more into that frame of thinking too. And, and actually in COVID, I figured out some new techniques that was first used in that drawing. Um, I'm using some stencils and stuff now. Okay, yeah. Uh, so the stencils, the stencils really allow me to, um, to get some different mark making. And now I'm thinking about drawing in a, in a whole new way that I, I hope will expand kind of my repertoire or the way that I work too. And some of my ideas too, um, trying to think about more how, how that materiality could feed into the actual content. So that's a lot to chew on. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, it's super interesting to see just how a small change in your, uh, the, the approach could really change how and inform your thinking. Mm -hmm. Do you, okay, so I think this is like my last question and then I'm gonna open it up for questions for a couple minutes from the audience, but um, I, uh, well, I have two questions. So if people don't have questions, I'll still ask. Uh, is there a piece of uh, advice that you would give your younger self knowing what you know today? Oh, boy. Um, 
that's always a challenging question, right? Uh, you, you know, take advantage of, of time as much as you can. Now that I have two small kiddos, um, I really have to be uh, on point when I'm in the studio. So I try to turn off notifications on my phone. I've deleted all games from my phone. I'm, I might even be deleting social media from my phone just so I can really focus in the studio. Back in the day uh, when I had more time, you know, I'd sometimes get into the studio and play a game on my phone to like get in the right headspace, which doesn't make any sense in retrospect. Uh, so sometimes I miss that kind of unbridled time, like just when you had so much time. And uh, now I also, I used to stay up until midnight, sometimes 2 a.m. and then go to work in the next morning uh, at an office job. So I would, I would draw all, you know, from when I got home from work until I went to bed and then wake up the next day. I, I wish I would have done even more of that because now it's, it's so hard when you have to put a baby to bed and, and get snacks all day for small, small humans. <laughs> yeah, so... so yeah, take advantage of time when you when you can and you know, just keep keep working. Maybe that's that Midwest of me. It's just like it's all about working in the studio and trying to like focus as much as you can. Yeah. And I guess one year ago, me, I wish I would have been able to go to a few more shows before everything <laughs> got locked down. I'm really missing that. I'm really missing seeing things in real life. Yeah, and the conversations that happen in real life. Yes, yes, yes. I miss connecting like that. So if, if does somebody have a question? Because otherwise I have one more question. Uh, does anybody who's here have a question for Melissa? I'm wondering, because I, I worked for a while on large drawings with and started with powdered graphite, and then I worked over it with pencils. And, and I always loved the powdered graphite in, and that was sometimes my favorite part, but you're not using any pencils at all. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I only recently started uh, a drawing that's in my show. Um, I drew like a lace bra and that was one of the first times I reintroduced the pencil just because I tried uh, uh, maybe three or four different techniques and I was like, I really like the ability of the line of the pencil just in that context. And that was the first time I've uh, drawn with pencil on top of my drawing since like 2009. So all of this, most of the mark making is really done by the eraser. Um, but now that's kind of expanding too now that I'm playing with other techniques, but yeah, still for the most part, no pencil. Interesting. Yeah. Do you have to wear a mask with the graphite or are you not that messy? <laughs> um, I'm not that messy. Um, I, my can of graphite is so old that it doesn't have a health warning on it. And I only recently found out that some people think it's super cancerous or it is super cancerous. Um, so fingers crossed, I'll be okay. Uh, now I have a bunch of masks, so I think I should wear it, but also sometimes I have to blow at the surface to just get that little tiny powder away. Um, but for the most part, it's not as messy as it was when I first started using the technique. I mean, you can see a little bit of, no, actually that's from spraying the grass, spraying the drawing at the end, but it's only a little, little line. Oh, I was gonna ask if you used fixative. Yeah, at the very end. Yeah. So I've, uh, I've worked back into drawings after spraying them, but they've got the paper ends up getting a really different texture after it's sprayed. So I try to leave it all the way to the end. Yeah, I, I was always afraid to try that. The fixative, <laughs> but I was working like five by seven feet. So it was, <sighs> all, yeah, not anymore though. It takes too long. <laughs> I love that large scale though. Uh, 50 by 90 is the biggest that I've done. So how big is that? 90? That's pretty close. That's almost, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, I've, I've done like three that size and I, I love that scale, but it, it makes shipping them a lot more complicated. <laughs> oh, I always rolled them up and put them in shipping tubes. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's easier than, than stretch canvases. Yeah. And I, I do the tubes too, but for some reason, uh, the 50 by 90s tend to be the ones that have gotten damaged in transit or getting hung up or. Yeah, I had that happen too. Yeah. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. Can, Melissa, would you tell me like why you think showing your work is important? How does that influence or inform your practice? Um, well, I, I love the community of the, the art world. I, I love being connected to people and sharing stories, sharing ideas. And I feel like sharing your work is part of that. Um, I like the dialogue that can happen around it, but, but also I, I like the idea of being able to like hit the viewer and hopefully in the heart a little bit with what, what I'm making. Um, and for me, like, seeing things in person is so important because uh, I hope that there's like an essence there or like an experience um, of being able to like be surrounded by something and really uh, see the surface up, up close. Because one of the tricks with my work is since it is based on ph photography or inspired by photography and then it becomes a drawing and then it becomes a photo again and then seen on a screen, that's, that's like a, like, I thought about making work specifically about that, like, why and what does that mean? And, you know, um, didn't Gerhard Richter, like, he was uh, hesitant to even have his artwork uh, photographed because he wanted people to see it in real life. Yeah, and I think that it's so meta when you say that. It's like you're, it starts out as this, you know, mm -hmm this light and light on paper and then it gets translated it changes a little bit and it's light and dark on paper but a different medium so mm -hmm. like it goes from being like silver to metal to or or light to <laughs> metal to and then this technology that then transforms and all these screens are so shiny and different and they take yeah. away some of that tactility so yeah it's well, I mean, especially I, when something big and you want to like be surrounded by it and then you look at it and it's like that big again, you know? It's like screen size. Everything is yeah. screen size right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we got to make do, right? <laughs> for the time being. Yeah. And maybe yeah. this will be a part of your digestion for the next, you know, six to eight months or whatever. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, and I'll be sure to send you a link uh, to the talk. Uh, hopefully we'll see lots more of your work in the future. Well, thank you, Emily. It was fun to chat with you. Yeah, take good care. Okay, you too. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. See y'all.